morning, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started this morning. Uh, we'll do some uh, quick little geothermal service procedures. Probably won't really take this that long, maybe a half hour webinar, so not, not super long today. Just cover a few things. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Carly's not with us today, but if you do have questions, uh, please just raise your hand on the uh, control panel and type out your question and I'll get to it as soon as I see it. If I don't see it, I'll get it, get to it at the very end. Again, this is me, uh, John Pendleton. I'm your trainer, senior uh, technician, been with Intertech for about seven and a half years now. So uh, I've been doing the trainings here for about five years now. Uh, I kind of took over the training department about six months ago. So we're making some changes especially with these uh, with these times now, obviously no in-person trainings right now, but we'll get back to that hopefully soon. I, I'm not gonna lie, I kind of miss being in front of the class, uh, interacting with the students. So I'm kind of ready for the quarantine to subside here in the great state of Illinois. <clears throat> if you need anything from me, uh, training information, uh, questions on training, PowerPoints, anything like that, uh, shoot me an email. That's usually the best way to get a hold of me, uh, and I'll get that information sent over to you. Now, hang on a second here. Sorry, I'm having a little technical difficulties here this morning. Hang on, it's loading. I don't know what's really happening this morning. Let's try this again. Let me uh, try something here real quick. I'm gonna put you guys on pause for a second. All right, I think I'm almost there. Hang on one second. <clears throat> okay. Well, this is how we're going to have to do it. And it's a little bit messed up, but uh, I had to do it on my desktop. So. Let's move on, maybe. There we go. Okay, so if you need to uh, pressurize your loop, the easiest way to add water to the system is with this little booster tool. And we do offer this booster tool, comes in a little uh, plastic uh, box that's got a little handle on it so you can carry it around. Uh, it's got a female garden hose on one end. It's got, with the valve closed, you can check the loop pressure in the system. 
because it's got a pressure gauge on it. Um, there is a little needle on the end of it, uh, so you can put it into your PT port. One thing I will say, before you hook up the garden hose and put it into the loop, make sure that you always bleed the air out of that out of that garden hose. Otherwise, you'll push all that air into the loop that you you know maybe you just flushed or whatever. But uh, we don't want to push all that air back in, so it's best to try to bleed it without that needle on there because it'll take a little while to bleed that air out of the you know you got a 50 foot 100 foot garden hose uh so try to bleed it out all the air out of the garden hose before you insert it into the pt port but this is basically the easiest way to goose up a system normally pressures on a loop field somewhere between 40 and 60 psi and that's normally accomplished with the city water pressure uh so unless you've got super low water pressure or super high water pressure we don't want to go over 100 psi i don't ever see it normally above about 80 uh, but you can go up to 100 i just wouldn't recommend it uh, there could be some pvc or some fittings that may not be able to hold that pressure on the water side so you don't want to get it too high on the low side as long as we have positive pressure coming out of the heat exchanger we're okay uh, so, you know, 10 PSI is probably the lowest we'd probably want to see. Pump replacement. Uh, it's a good idea when you are replacing a pump, if you do have a, a loop gooser, because you can, uh, if you've got PTs at the flow center, you can put the gooser into the PT port with no hose on it or with a hose on it and drain it, whatever water is, under, or is at that pump. You can drain that water out and into a drain. You can also drain it into a bucket or something like that, like this picture here. Um, you got really pressurized or non-pressurized anymore. It seems like uh, they've got the three-way valves on there, so you can isolate the flow centers, which is definitely nice. Now, if you were to just shut off the flow center with a three-way valve and take that pump off, water's gonna pour out, not a bunch, but basically what's ever above that pump in between the pumps and the shutoffs that water is going to come out so what you could do is you've got your flushing ports so you can hook up the uh, fitting to the flush port put a hose on there into a bucket and then you can turn that three-way valve and bleed that water out of there again there won't be a whole lot um, maybe half gallon uh, and you will get a tiny bit of water when you pull the pump off because the pump is below where the water is draining out. So you, there'll be basically what's in the volume will come out. So it, it, don't be surprised if a little bit of water comes rolling out of that. It's really not that big of a deal. Uh, it won't be that much. But you can you know, close those three ways, pull the pump off. When you do pull the pump off, I always recommend taking a look at the pump. You know. Anybody can uh, anybody can replace a pump. You know, it, it's when you take a look at that pump and see why it failed. You know, that's what makes you a better technician. So you know, you're not just a parts changer at that point. Now you're a problem solver. So take a look at the pump and see why it failed. You know, pumps are very similar to the compressors. I'm not going to say that they don't fail on their own. But normally it's caused by something else in the system. Uh, poor water quality, debris, air, something like that. So if you take the pump apart, you'll see the impeller right below the impeller. Uh, you'll see like a little silver ring and a black gasket. Between that black gasket and that silver ring, you can take a screwdriver and pry that out. And the stator will pop out of the bowl on that pump. And then you can take a look at the stator and the bowl. And it'll tell you if it's all rainbowed up, you know that it got hot. More than likely, that's due to air. Uh, if bad water quality, it's going to show you're going to have rust or calcium buildup or something like that. So just you've already got the pump apart or taken out. Take a little screwdriver, pop that out, take a quick look at it and see why it failed. Uh, if it's bad water quality, you know, you may want to flush the loop. You got air in it, definitely flush the loop and make sure that when you replace these pumps, that you turn that screw and flood that shaft or else it'll burn up the new pump uh, because they're liquid cooled. So if you get air in there, 
it'll not allow water to circulate to that pump and it'll overheat that pump. Make sure we're always using the blast black Grunfoss pumps because those are uh, below 40 degree application. They got coated windings and they got a weep hole for condensation. Uh, the red pumps are more for boiler applications and they just won't last as long in a geothermal system. Now it will work, it just won't work as long. So You can replace the gaskets on a leaking flow center if it's out of warranty. If it's in warranty, don't worry about it. Uh, just file a warranty for a replacement flow center. But if it's out of warranty, uh, you can order the gasket kit. It'll have three gaskets and a new snap ring. Basically, you take this snap ring off with a pair of snap ring pliers, uh, and then you're gonna have to put a 3 8 square drive socket in there, that square hole there, and you're gonna have to turn it back and forth and kind of it's it's kind of weird hard to explain but you're gonna have to kind of pull a little bit while you're twisting and then it'll slowly work that that uh, inner portion out that has the gaskets on it you can kind of see it in that lower picture there uh, of the gaskets towards the end of it in the snap ring so you can take it apart look at the gaskets uh you see a lot of you know, calcium buildup or rust or something like that's probably due to bad water quality. I will mention one thing on these, really a pressurized or non-pressurized flow center. You ever have a brand new one and it's leaking, you think it's leaking from the factory? More than likely it's not. What I've seen in my experience here at Intertech is that if you do not get your source water lines coming in there straight, if they're caught just a little bit, those gaskets don't seal properly, that double O-ring, and it'll leak. When it leaks, it'll actually come out of those gaskets and run down the flow center. It won't come out of the top and run outside of it. It'll normally run out the back. It'll find, it'll work its way through the insulation on the back, and it'll look like the flow center is leaking. So I always, especially on a brand new install, I always tell them, make sure those pipes are coming in there straight because if they're kinked or they're cocked just a little bit, they will leak and it'll look like it's leaking internally on the flow center. Um, I dealt with this a lot when I first started. Uh, we'd bring flow centers back and test them and they wouldn't be leaking. So uh, just, just remember to get those lines on the source water lines coming in straight. This is a great calculation for an open loop system. Uh, we can do this heat, heat exchanger scaling calculation, and that'll tell us if we need to clean that brace plate or the, uh, could be brace plate, could be coaxial, but normally we do this on a uh, open loop because at some point it will need to be cleaned. So basically in heating mode, we take the evaporator, uh, or the, excuse me, the average fluid temperature of the source water. So source water in, source water out, add those together and divide by two. That gets your uh, average fluid temperature. And then your evaporator temperature is your suction pressure on your refrigerant gauge converted to temperature. And then you just do the math. In cooling mode, same thing, only we're, we're still gonna use the average fluid temperature, uh, but we're also gonna take the condenser temperature, which is your discharge pressure converted to temperature, and then do the math. Usually five to 15 is normal. Anything over 15 is starting to scale up, and anything definitely over 20 is scaled up and will need to be cleaned. I've got an example here in this next slide. So we've got 50 degree entering water temperature, 45 degree leaving water temperature. So you add those together, so that's 95. Divide that by two, and that gives us our average water temperature. So 95 divided by two is 47 and a half. So now we know our uh, average water temperature. Now we're in heating mode, so we're gonna use our suction pressure. So we take that 85 suction pressure, and we're gonna convert that to temperature. So 86 is 25 degrees, that's pretty close. So 
now we can take that 25 degrees and subtract that out of our 47 and a half. And that gives us 22.5 degree difference. So anything over 20, we know is scaled up. So this tells us, yeah, we need to go ahead and clean that heat exchanger. Again, in cooling mode, we'll go through one here in cooling, uh, we're gonna use discharge pressure. So again, average water temperature of your source in and out. So here we have 80 and 90, add those together and divide by two. So 170 divided by two is 85. <clears throat> That's our average water temperature. Now we take our discharge pressure of 185. Now, normally you're not going to see it that low, but just for this calculation, uh, I just kind of wanted to show it. So at 183.2 is 65, so that's pretty close. So now we can take the 85 minus 65, that gives us 20 degrees. So again, 5 to 15 is normal over 20 is suspe suspected of scaling. So this one would need to be uh, cleaned. Again, in heating mode, suction temperature converted to, suction pressure converted to temperature, and in cooling mode, discharge pressure converted to temperature. Now, if you do get a result of anything over 20. Let me go back for a second. Let's say you get a calculation of 17. You know, you're above the five to 15, but you're below the 20. In that situation, I'd kind of have to look at why was I out there? Am I just there for a service call? Uh, did I get called out there because the unit's not keeping up? What was the call? What? Why was the reason we were called out there? So, if you're called out there because the unit's not keeping up or it's got a high pressure issue or something like that, then you may want to go ahead and clean it. Um, if you just came out there to do a cleaning check, if you've got time, you know, you may want to ask the customer if they would like you to clean it. If they don't, just make a note in your ticket to make sure to check that number the next time you're out there and make sure it hasn't increased and gotten closer to the 20. Uh, but if you're slow, you know, you can tell the homeowner, hey, I can clean this out, probably take me maybe an hour or so, and you'd be good to go and kind of give you something to do uh, in, your, in, in your shoulder seasons. Here's the process for cleaning of the heat exchanger. Now, when we flush through the heat exchanger, we're gonna uh, flush through the opposite. So reverse return, basically, uh, we're gonna pump into the out and back from the in. Basically, you can get a little acid pump or a uh, submersible pump, a little five gallon bucket. I would recommend maybe using ice machine cleaner or some form of like a muriatic acid to flush, flush the heat exchanger. Uh, just gonna depend on how much stuff is in your water on how long you're gonna have to flush it. Uh, but you should be able to see by the water coming back what how much more you need to clean it. Once you get done with the chemicals, always make sure to use some fresh water and circulate it through there to get any of the uh, uh, remaining chemical that might be in there that could cause pitting or something like that. So make sure you always flush it out and never freeze clean a heat exchanger. I know Econar back in the day used to do that all the time, but Things can happen when you freeze. Um, so we do not recommend freeze cleaning of our heat exchangers. If you need to get a sample of fluid, uh, it's not real hard to do on a uh, non-pressurized system because you can just take the cap off the tank and either, you know, put a, a cup down in there or like use a turkey baster and suck some fluid out uh, but that's pretty easy on a pressurized system it makes it a little bit more difficult because you've got pressure in the system you can't just open it up and let it fly uh, i would recommend using that loop gooser and uh, with the needle on it turn the system on so the pumps are running and you keep pressure up 
attach the loop gooser to the water out PT port and open up the valve on the gooser. Now, when you do that, water is going to come out. So put like a bucket or a, a bottle or something on the end of it uh, so you can catch that fluid. And then uh, you can uh, pull some of that fluid out. Now, once you pull that fluid out, you can check your antifreeze level. If you've got a refractometer, we can just put a drop on it. Um, it makes it pretty easy. You don't really need to try real hard to get any fluid out. But uh, if you're using a hydrometer, you're going to need, I don't know, maybe 10, 12 ounces of water in a long cylinder to be able to stick that hydrometer down in it and let it float. So uh, you'll have to have a little bit more fluid if you're using a hydrometer. The hydrometers, they can be a little bit weird to read. I'm gonna go ahead and flip over this slide here because if you look over to the left, this is the stem of the hydrometer, the bulb and stuff you can't really see on the picture. But uh, what I wanted to know you guys to see is if you look over to the left of the chart, you'll see 1.00, that's straight water. So that's 32 degree freeze protection. Uh, and you look at the numbers following below it, you got 0 0.99, 0 0.98, 0 0.97, 0 0.96. Well, if you look over at the hydrometer, it just says 90, 80, 70, 60. So it doesn't really, you're like, well, I don't see two nines, I only see one. If you look like this where the arrow's pointing, that's actually 0 0.985. You can see, you would think it's just 85. There's a hidden nine in front of that because 1.0 being straight water, right above that is 0.9999999. So nine's all the way across. So there's actually a hidden nine on these numbers. So if you look at this and you would say 85, yes, but there's also a hidden nine in front of it. So it'd be 0.985. So you follow that over. That's about 17 and a half degree freeze protection uh, with your uh, uh, methanol right there. This is showing methanol and ethanol. Uh, they're lighter than water, so that their their number is going to be below one. And propylene glycol is heavier than water, so it, its numbers are going to be 1.0 something, 1.04 or something like that, and it's going to go up. Uh, where the, this is methanol and ethanol here. Detecting the type of antifreeze, uh, specific gravity is a great way to tell. If you put your hydrometer, your propylene glycol hydrometer in there and it sinks all the way to the bottom, uh, then you know that you've got uh, methanol or alcohol based in there and vice versa if you were to put the methanol or ethanol refractometer in it's going to float all the way to the top at the zero mark at the one mark basically uh, to let you know that it's got the wrong different type of antifreeze i usually base it off a of smell because that's all i got a lot of times color um, isn't very consistent so reds are usually a glycol, reds, pinks are glycols, blues and greens are normally alcohol, uh, but I don't normally base it off of color. Feel is a good way as well. Glycol is gonna feel slippery when you first put it on your fingers, and then as it dries, it's gonna be sticky because it's sugar-based. Alcohol is gonna feel dry and almost give like a cooling effect when it's on your skin because it's gonna evaporate. Normally you can smell it and it'll somewhat smell like a rubbing type alcohol. Uh, so sometimes you can base it off a of smell as well. And glycol is gonna smell kind of sweet. Uh, I'm not really sure exactly how to explain that smell, but if you ever smelled it, you might kind of know. Uh, alcohol is gonna smell like, again, like a rubbing alcohol, not like Jack Daniels. Although it'd be better if it did smell like Jack Daniels than rubbing alcohol, but then people might drink it, I guess. If you need to clean a microchannel coil, uh, water is the only recommended cleaning process for debris removal. Uh, if you do want to use a cleaner, 
it's got to have a pH between five and nine. Uh, cannot contain chloride, sulfates, copper, iron, nickel, or titanium. And that's gone through a test protocol to demonstrate compatibility with aluminum. Uh, you can use a pressure washer. Just make sure you got any kind of soaps or chemicals that are in it out. Uh, clean the face by spraying the coil steady and uniformly from top to bottom, directing the spray straight at the coil. I personally would not recommend using a pressure washer. Uh, things can happen. You get the angle wrong, it's going to bend up those fins. You're not going to get those fins straightened back out. So I would just use a garden hose. They're only on the indoor coil, so if you keep the filter in place and clean, then you should never have to clean one. You can also use a vacuum, uh, like a shop bag, if you need to uh, suck some of the dirt off of it. You can use a shop vac with maybe uh, uh, like a bristle brush on it to suck the uh, any kind of dirt or debris out of it. If you need to make a repair on a micro channel, uh, it should be under warranty, I would think. So if it's under warranty, don't worry about it. Uh, if it's out of warranty, basically on these coils, you're going to cut out the bad section, plug it up is all you're really going to do. You're not really repairing it and allowing refrigerant to flow through that section. Uh, with the micro channel coils, there's so many small openings that if you were to have to block off part of it, it's not going to really affect the operation. Uh, I'm not a, the greatest welder on aluminum, so uh, I'm not going to lie, I've never done this repair on the micro channel coil. We do have a kit you can get. Uh, you have to give us a call. We don't necessarily have a part number for that, but if it's under warranty, don't really worry about it too much. Just file a warranty and we'll send you another air coil out. But if it gets hit by something, um, you know, from the return and it, it, it busts open, you can repair it. And I can always point you to the uh, YouTube video where you can, it's about a two or three minute video uh, and you can watch the video there on how to do it. Just got to be real careful not to overheat it or you'll melt the aluminum. It'll just disappear. If you need to find a leak in a heat exchanger, if you think it's a leak in a heat exchanger because you can't find a leak anywhere else, don't just assume that it's in the heat exchanger because when you do that, it's more than likely not going to be in the heat exchanger. And I'll get it back, I'll test it, and there won't be a problem, and we'll bill you back. So don't ever just assume, for one, a coax is not, or a brace plate, key exchanger, they're not that fun to replace. Uh, this is an XT or a CT, uh, looks like an XT uh, unit here, where the heat exchanger is in the very bottom, so you got to take about everything out of the system so you can get to that heat exchanger. So don't make it your first decision to always confirm it. If you've got a press, pressurized system, you can basically close your three-way valves on your flow center and put a pressure gauge in your PT port. As long as you've got refrigerant pressure that's higher than the water pressure, then it will push refrigerant into the water. So you can sit there and watch it, and if your pressure raises with no pumps running and nothing on, then you know that it's pushing water into the into the uh, or pushing refrigerant into the water side. When that happens, we really need to look at it as well and see did the refrigerant pressure drop all the way out below the water pressure, and then now is water pushing back into the refrigerant circuit? So check and see if you've got water in your refrigerant circuit if you've got a heat exchanger refrigerant leak. Uh, because if it does cross-contaminate, then we're going to have to approach the replacement. Uh, we're going to have to approach the repair at a, a differently. Because once you get water in the refrigerant circuit, the unit's pretty much crap. You can never get all that water out, and you'll continuously lose compressors. You know, it may take two or three years, but that moisture starts eating away at the uh, windings, 
basically create some acid in there and you'll just keep losing the pressures time and time again. How to find a leak in an air coil? If you have enough refrigerant in the operate, uh, put the unit in heat pump mode. Unplug the fan from the Molex uh, power supply. Basically, you can either pull the low voltage or the high voltage off the ECM, uh, and it won't run. So it's going to build pressure on in the heating mode. So your your evaporator is going to raise pressure, and that should cause your uh, refrigerant leak to be a little bit more uh, the leak rate faster. So you maybe be able to find it a little bit easier. In my personal experience, I have found that um, soap bubbles don't really work so well on these microchannel air coils. It's one thing if it's on the end or on the side of it, but if it's in the middle of the heat exchanger or the air coil, you're probably not going to get it with soap bubbles. One thing that is nice about the microchannel air coil is oil. Once there's oil on it, it's going to turn the air coil a darker shade of silver or gray. So if you can get to the return, take the filter out and take a look at it. If not, look on the back side where the blower is and you'll see, you should see oil uh, or oil staining on the air coil. And that's a pretty obvious sign that it's in the air coil. I have seen these air coils leak. It's normally near the header on one, one side or the other. And uh, it's a little fine crack that I've seen if they are leaking. Uh, so look in the corners. That's probably going to be your culprit. If the unit doesn't have doesn't operate and doesn't have refrigerant, obviously uh, pressurize it up with nitrogen. Um, you can go up pretty high with nitrogen. Uh, the refrigerant circuit is rated for I think it's 850 psi. I don't recommend going that high, but I checked at at the uh, at the office, I check stuff between 400 and 450 psi because a lot of times that I mean I've got it on a table and you know the air coils right in front of me. I, I don't have it in a unit, but a lot of times I can hear the leak uh, in the air coil. So and it seems like that 300 psi, nothing. It's almost like that 400 mark. You can almost hear it open up. Uh, and so put more pressure in if you can't find it. Just don't go above about 450, 500 PSI. If you do, it's not gonna be the end of the world, but uh, there's no real need to go any higher than that. Uh, 410 systems, uh, that's not new anymore. So just make sure you got the proper tools. One thing I will say is on a 410 system, they love moisture. They will suck moisture. Uh, matter of fact, like the, the oil that's in there, 410, uh, it can actually suck moisture through plastic. So that's why the oil normally comes in a metal container because it'll actually suck moisture through the pores. If you've ever gotten the oil on your hands, it's almost like getting, you know, you've been working with concrete or something. It just sucks all the moisture from your hands as well. So if you have the system open, make sure that you're changing the filter dryer. It's the only way to get all the moisture out of the system. So make sure we're always doing that. We're gonna uh, charge in a liquid and use subcooling for charging for uh, with a TXV. Never torch out a component. I can't state that enough. It's one of my pet peeves. Uh, you know, I get stuff back all the time and I ask, I tell them, do not unbraze it cut it from the system. I get it back, what is it unbrazed? The problem I have with unbrazing is you're doing the same thing as brazing, just without the little uh, rod in your hand, and you're not bleeding nitrogen when you're doing that. On R22 systems with lower pressure and the mineral oil, 
we didn't have the problem with the scrubbing of the walls and you know breaking off that oxide and getting it stuck in your TXVs. The 410, you know, you got your higher pressures and that oil, it really scrubs those walls and all that oxide buildup will then break off and get stuck somewhere. That's either going to get stuck in your pilot tubes on your reversing valve, in your TXV, or on your filter dryer. So if you need to unbraze something, then you better be running nitrogen through it. But I guarantee you it doesn't happen. And it's a huge pet peeve of mine, huge. Uh, they're just adding problems to the system. When I get parts back that are unbrazed, I make a note in the computer so that when their TXV fails the next time that we've got a record of it, they're not brazing properly. You know, it's not my desire to uh, deny warranty claims, but it is my desire to fix problems. And that's a problem in our, in our industry is not brazing with nitrogen or unbrazing without nitrogen. So um, I know I kind of harp on that quite a bit, but it's just because it bothers me so much. It's such a simple little thing. Uh, guys don't like to braze with nitrogen because they don't, they can't get their holes sealed up. And that's because they're using too high a pressure. They don't have a, 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 a nitrogen uh, bleed regulator. And so they get too much pressure on it and it won't seal up that final hole. So guys don't like using it or they don't want to carry their tanks around, but we have to in 410 systems or else you're just asking for TXV problems all day long. We got enough problems with TXVs. We don't need to add to it. Again, filter dryer, whenever the system is open, replace it. We send these with every uh, warranty refrigerant repair. You know, I get parts back and I'll have that uh, filter dryer brand new in the, in, the, in the box with it. Now, maybe you used your own filter dryer. I don't know, but it doesn't look good when I get the brand new one back. And I, again, I'm pretty good about documenting things and I'll put a note in the computer that the filter dryer that we sent was not used. Now, that doesn't mean you didn't replace it. I don't know why you just wouldn't use ours, but maybe you don't like ours. I don't know. But make sure you're replacing filter dryers. Unloader. Uh, the unloader is your second stage solenoid on the uh, for shifting the compressor. If you ever have a problem with the compressor shifting or you don't think it's shifting, you can remove that plug while you've got a Y2, Y1 and a Y2 call. And the amperage should go up and down on the compressor about 25 to 30%, which is about three to five amps. So you can unplug it or you can remove the Y2 call and plug it back in. It's not going to hurt anything. It doesn't hurt the compressor to shift on the fly. Um, so just the Y2, the Y1, you take the Y1 away, you got to wait five minutes. Uh, so just the Y2, you can energize and de-energize that and look at your amp draw. It's the biggest, best way to tell if your compressor is shifting. Sometimes you can hear it and sometimes you can't. So amp draw is the best way to tell. If you don't get the expected results, again, you can shut the system down and just jumper R to Y2 and you should hear a clicking sound. If you don't hear that, you can remove the molded plug and check the resistance of the unloader at the compressor. So at the black plug, you can ohm it out. There's two little holes in there. There's only You can only put your meter in two places. So put it there. Your ohm resistance, depending on temperature, could be somewhere between 32 and 60 ohms. If you don't, if your resistance doesn't seem quite right, you can also check the voltage of the plug. Uh, remember that on the plug, AC voltage in, there's a rectifier in this plug and it's DC voltage out. So we should be somewhere around 24 volts in and somewhere around 24 volts out DC. Now my meter changes it over automatically from AC to DC. Uh, some meters do not, so make sure you switch it over and check DC voltage out of the plug. You don't really have a whole lot of problems with these. Every once in a while, we'll have one short out, but for the most part, you know they're they're a pretty reliable uh, 
uh, solenoid plug. So with that, that's all I've really got for today. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, a few little uh, tidbits on our service procedures for the uh, service tech. So if you got any questions, feel free to ask. If not, if you want some training info, shoot me an email. Um, I won't keep you too long today. Thanks again, guys, and stay safe and have a have a great week out there.